Thank you, and uh, I want to publicly thank Dr. Chaudhry for his vision on behalf of all of us who are in the health and wellness field. Thank you. So I want to kind of encapsulate four kind of concepts in a little bit of a half an hour, and that's homeopathy, isopathy, biomedicine, and something was talked about earlier by Dr. Gregg, he called it energy and I call it frequency because the new concept is frequency medicine. Think about how everybody's voices are different here. Why? Because there's different frequencies. How do we tell a million cell phones to find each other? They're different frequencies. So there's not a good or bad, that concept is not seen by the body, but there's a definite concept of high and low energy. If I said to you, do you think organic food's higher energy than junk food? You'd say, sure, I, believe. I think so. But generally your body would say, I don't have an opinion, but I want the higher energy, because energy is everything. The technology now is that these things are measurable. Not that we're not on the shoulders of the ancient Chinese who did acupuncture and so forth. We are. But these new machines today, and a few of them that I have at my natural medicine pharmacy in the North Hills, measures frequencies. So we can tell distinctly the frequency between things like lead, mercury, and cadmium, and mold and fungus, and st strap, st uh, staph and strep, things like that. So that's something that uh, I'm not going to talk about today, but I want you to think about frequencies. Now, the theory of homeopathy comes from 250 years ago, Samuel Hahnemann from Germany. What impressed me about this, because I only got into it a couple years ago, is that this, this guy was a pharmacologist. And my doctor's in pharmacology, so I really saw the connection there. But I think if you saw and talk to some clinical pharmacologists today, they might think this is voodoo medicine, but it's not. If we were walking 100 years ago in Oakland, right past Shadyside Hospital, it was, the Sh it was the Pittsburgh Homeopathic Hospital. Now, why would they have put that word on the brick in front of the building if it wasn't effective to some degree? And of course, they wouldn't. Oh, but things changed in the late 20s and 30s when the Rockefeller family took over medicine and change things, and homeopathy was put in the background. But you know, these things are coming back. There's this trend toward holistic medicine. It's growing all over the place, especially in our country. And I think a lot of practitioners do come conferences like this, um, you know, are really kind of astute in this, and I think it's exciting work. Hahnemann said that likes cure likes. Now, the controversy here is that when you take homeopathy, you're talking about very minute, minute quantities of plants, minerals, or sometimes animal products. And when you dilute them, say I have a glass of water here and I put one drop of a plant extract in there, say milk thistle or something like that, and I take one drop out of that, that's one X. If I take one drop out of that and put it in another bottle, another 10 bottles, it's 10 X. And it's diluted. 10 times. It should be incredibly weaker, but it's not. It's stronger. How do we attest to that? We can't. But the point is, we don't have to. There's certain things that I think science can't explain, but it doesn't mean it's not relevant. And we'll talk about the placebo effect here in a minute. So we see that homeopathy fits very well with this current aspect of biomedicine. In biomedicine, the difference between isopathy and homeopathy is the milieu. And the milieu is another fancy word for the environment, the gut, intestinal gut, where we absorb all our nutrients, get rid of our waste, break down food. And if we didn't absorb our nutrients, we wouldn't be on the planet very long. So outside of the milieu, isopathy works from that standpoint. Now, if you've read anything in the news here lately, especially in the medical field, you know Monday a week ago there was hearings by the FDA on homeopathy. This is the first time in 25 or 30 years they did hearings on this. And I know some of the people that went to testify on behalf of the homeopathy and other, um, the, you know, the whole science. And thank goodness back in 1994, we passed the DeShea Act. Many people know that before 1994, the only two things you could put in your body was a drug or a food. There was no category for things like herbs and vitamins and nutrients and amino acids. Were they drugs or were they foods? Well, let's take cranberry. We know cranberry is a food, but we know it's very effective for UTI. So is it a drug or a food? Or is it both? Well, in their wisdom, and I'm very proud to be associated with the American Botanical Council out of Austin, Texas, because that's the herbal group that really represents 
any controversy or news about herbs that come up in Congress or something like that. But there was a lot of work. In fact, there were more letters sent on behalf of the Deshea than against the Vietnam War. And of course, it passed. And for the first time, we had this next category called dietary supplements, which really solved a lot of problems, a lot of confusion for people. So the conclusion of these meetings last week are not decisive yet. I just talked to a friend of mine who was there, and he said, well, I'm not sure we're going to be able to have homeopathy for the rest of the year because the government tries to look at these as not dietary supplements. They try to think that they're more allopathic medicines. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But they're not really drugs as we think of drugs. So the controversy continues, and I think to the detriment of the American people because there's so many positive aspects of homeopathy. Now, I want to talk about a fellow that may, maybe you've heard of. He wrote the famous book, The Biology of Belief. Again, what Dr. Nicosia said this morning about this energy, he kind of brings it together, this whole aspect of energy frequency and how it applies to supplements or vitamins or nutrients we put in our body. That's Bruce Lipton. And he asked questions like, knowledge is power. Maybe that's why we're here. Lack of knowledge relinquishes power. Are you a victim of heredity? Good question, because a lot of times the doctor will say, well, you know, it's just in your genes. Mom and dad had it. That's why you have diabetes. Well, I'm not sure about that. We think it's about 5 or 15%. Sometimes what we get from mom and dad and grandma, bad habits. We get lots of those. Beliefs can stimulate molecules. The biology of belief. That's his book. This is very interesting stuff because it all ties into what we call holistic medicine. So he says, we're not powerless biochemical machines that need to pop a pill every time we have a mental or physical malaise. Drugs and surg surgeries are powerful tools, but there's something beyond that. And beyond that, in the word I don't think of thought so much, I think of perception. Perception is really important here and focusing on our perception and how the environment plays that. We, we play a part in our environment. There's absolutely no doubt about that. I'm not going to talk about it, but you can read this guy's book. Now, I think of this, uh, Dr. Beck this morning talked about her cancer recovery, and we're not dismissing the chemo and radiation, but I would say that my perception is that her perception was that the plant-based diet was more healing for her than even the chemo and radiation, and it probably was because it was her perception of that. Whether it's true or not, insignificant. Everybody's an individual. So the way to look at medicine today, biomedicine, energy medicine, frequency medicine, everybody's an individual. Everybody with diabetes does not have the same diabetes. Everybody with bipolar does not have the same bipolar disease. Everybody with cancer does not have the same cancer. It's very individualistic. And this is where medicine should be going. But you know, what's going on in the marketplace with whatever's going on. <laughs> Doctors see you less, everybody's a specialist. We're not really getting individual attention. I think we all can agree that you know women with breast cancer are pretty much gonna get 31 treatments of radiation, chemo, and maybe tamoxifen, but you know, they're not all the same. They're not all having the same cancer. So do we have control over our genes? This is the concept of this epigenetics. Very interesting about how our perceptions can shape our biology. I encourage you to read this book. Now, he talks about waging war against microorganisms. Well, this is what we've done with antibiotics and many drugs. Folks, the age of antibiotics is over. We've known that in the 70s. They were big things. You know, everybody was taking penicillin, amoxicillin, and they were taking Keflex and Cephalexin. There hasn't been a new antibiotic created in the last 10 years. Why? Because the bugs are getting smarter. They're mutating, shape-shifting away from these things, and they're not working anymore. It's like we need more and more pesticides because the bugs get resistant to the pesticides. So there's this move to go back into nature, and I'm glad I'm part of that because I think homeopathy, herbal medicine, so many of these things are associated with it. Here he thinks that this variety of diseases is only maybe 5%. Some people say up to 15. So cancer, heart disease, diabetes, that definitely doesn't mean that you're going to get it because it's in your family. You may have a more compromised organ. My dad was diabetic, my brother's diabetic, my grandmother's diabetic, but I don't have diabetes, but I think I have a compromised pancreas, so I have to be a little careful because the pancreas could have a little bit of a frequency imbalance. That's something you have to watch. We talked about food. Certainly go over and see Sven, this wonderful new lifestyle medicine. He talks about the food revolution, and everybody knows Dean Ornish, and Dean Ornish here said, just changing your diet, your lifestyle, in 90 days can 
turn things around like prostate cancer. So Bruce finishes up by talking about these receptor antennas and how things like biological behavior plays a part in these invisible forces. And he gets into things like homeopathy and isopathy. Of course, penicillin came from a mold. So we're talking about not the drug so much, there's nothing wrong with the drug, but the mold can be used as a homeopathic, and it's not the drug. So if you're allergic to penicillin, can you take a homeopathic penicillin? Absolutely, shouldn't have any problems at all. So we're trying to get away from maybe just this pharmaceutical free energy medicine, and really it's taking over. I mean, the, as Dr. Chaudhry said, uh, America takes half the drugs in the whole world, and we have, what, eight, nine percent of the population. This placebo effect's interesting, okay, because the famous study that came out in psychology was in 2000 out of London. And they took, I don't know, a couple hundred people with depression and they gave them either the placebo, St. John's wort, or Paxil. Now after all this analysis, and I think it took a year or so, the best results were from the placebo. Second was Paxil, and St. John's wort was a close third. What came out in the headlines of the study? Paxil's more effective than St. John's wort. They dismiss the placebo because they can't explain it. And this is what science does. They just dismiss it. This is why Lipton left teaching at the medical school and started asking these questions like, is the placebo effect relevant? It is relevant. So because it's relevant, it needs to be explained. It just doesn't mean to be dismissed. But that's what we, we have to be careful of. So it gets down to this quantum physics. Many of the machines I use are quantum energy machines, quantum frequency machines. And it basically just means that the microcosm is the same as the macrocosm. We can't always explain it, but it is. Every cell in your body has everything that's in your body, every nutrient, every mineral, every emotion, every toxin. If I take a drop of water from the middle of the Pacific or Atlantic, everything that's in that ocean, every pollutant, every toxin, every microbe, it's in the drop. So we can pick those up, and that's what quantum energy is all about. The fact that we can't explain this all, and one of the things came up with the FDA is you have such small amounts of these things, how can they be in homeopathy, how can it be effective, how can it elicit a, a pharmaceutical response, but it does. Now, my guru for this is Dr. Rao. If you look this up, he's from the Paracelsus Clinic in Switzerland, so a couple years ago I got certified in biomedicine. But what he's doing here in Switzerland and Switzerland's not part of the EU, so they're a little bit more autonomy when it comes to like being in control of the FDA, is he has a big staff that works on things like chronic diseases. So he's talking about at 85 autoimmune diseases and cancer. And he has a pretty good record. He's not saying he's curing cancer, he's not, but some of these statistics he has are amazing. So he tries to heal chronic diseases, less susceptible disease, rebuilds in months, and of course he works on the milieu because he believes all these things start in the gut and they probably do. 95% of prostate cancer patients with high PSAs, uh, reverse treatment, two, five years. His best results is the last 200 fourth stage breast cancer patients he had, not one of them had a metastasis. He didn't cure the cancer, but of course after the chemo and radiation, what are you worried about? Where's it gonna spread to next? It's gonna go to my liver, my kidney, bingo. And that's what he's been successful at. His paradigms in this biomedicine are threefold. Detoxification, intestinal health and bacteria, regenerate and rebuild. There's a new buzzword in medicine, natural medicine especially, and it's called oxidative stressors. The old word was free radicals. Oxidative stressors are those elements in the environment that are aging us. Think of the old car sitting out in the backyard and the wind and rain is going to start rusting the car. That car is aging. That's a chemical process. We don't rust because we're not metal, but we oxidize. That's why we take antioxidants, right? Most antioxidants are in fruits and vegetables. There's none in meat, milk, dairy, and cheese. That's protein, but there's no antioxidants. So, but beyond these stressors, we call them, sometimes emotional stress, always a big factor, pesticides, herbicides, they're all over the place. Folks, be careful of Roundup. I'm telling you, this stuff is very toxic. You're not going to hear about it in this country, but watch if your husband or everybody's out there spraying this stuff. You know, you're not supposed to put your dog out in the lawn for a couple of days. Why would you put your kids or yourself out there? This is lots of negative reports, but it's getting buried by 
big corporations, be careful of this stuff. I find it in about 60% of patients, and I'm not saying it's gonna cause cancer and diabetes, I don't know that. But I know one thing for sure, it's a nerve disruptor. So lots of problems with people developing neuralgia or Parkinson's, could be things like that. In fact, there's a great new study out about could there be a connection between Roundup and autism? Very interesting. Because Roundup came out in 93, 94, and that's when autism spiked. Interesting. So we look at things like parasites, flora, mineral deficiencies. How do we find these things, frequencies? We can measure them now. Because, again, everything has a unique signature. And the technology or these things are measurable. And we can kind of look into kinesiology a little bit. There's a very sophisticated kinesiology. We know chiropractors do it a lot. It works, there's bias to it, but there's certain machines that can take the bias out of it. So what Dr. Rao would say is, think about the barrel. We've got this wonderful immune system God gave us. It's a barrel. But what happens when things go awry? The barrel runneth over. It's full. And it's leaking over top. Now things go awry. And these are all these things that are possibly causing these things. We call them, again, the oxidative stressors. One of the things he might say that I think I remember the most, if you ask your physician and you say, well, how did I get RA? How did I get lupus? How did I get Hashimoto's cancer? And of course, they're going to say, we don't know. And I'm not saying I know. I'm not saying Dr. Rao knows. But he says, think about the three most likely causes that aren't taught in med school. So I don't think our doctors are disingenuous. It just wasn't taught in med school. Heavy metal toxins, parasites, most common, mold and fungus. It's pervasive. And think about like rust on my car, okay? My car's still gonna run, but sooner or later that rust is gonna cause the car to be inefficient. That's what we're talking about here. So we have to look for these things. Now let's talk about the intestines quickly. The mucosal lining is all about the gut. Again, absorbing nutrients, get erased, how we break down our food. We have 10 to 100 times more bacteria in our body than human cells. And we've got trillions of cells. So the good news or the bad news is we're about 90% bacteria. <laughs> so we have to think about that. And uh, there's something that Dr. Rao always says, it's not real, I don't know, maybe a little gross to think of, but you know, we have this bacteria keeping us alive and what happens when we die? The bacteria just eats us. So that's what happens in a grave, right? Interesting stuff, right? So anyway, we, we talk about this intestinal flora and how this whole concept of aging, you know, because I think there's a lot of work in this. Here's a, a newborn with 98% of the immune cells, but at 10 years old, they were 90%. Well, how many do we have when we're 40 and 60 and 80? Interesting stuff, and I think there's a lot of science going on in this. Uh, if you get to the booth a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about this ASEA, because it's talking about this redox, which is a fancy word that means communication of cells. And how we age, there's a lessening of this communication. And we're not reversing aging, but we can improve this communication, especially when it comes to things like autoimmune diseases. So lots of ways to destroy this intestinal wall. And this is what leads to these immune and cancer. He would think all these just about, unless it's heredity, and it could be heredity, of course, starts in the gut. Food allergies, big things today. And I call them food sensitivities, too, because it's not like you eat peanuts and go to the emergency room. That's, that's an allergy. But there's a lot of sensitivities. And if you don't think they're putting pesticides and herbicides and hormones and antibiotics in our food supply, they are. It doesn't matter what you think today. And we don't know these things. And, you know, I, I kind of don't have time to watch Dr. Oz, and I respect him because he seems to, lots of people like this show. But why did he get attacked? It wasn't because he came out and sold stuff for weight loss. He said the nasty word two weeks ago. Uh, GMO should be labeled. That's what got him in trouble. Now, can you believe that? In a country like ours, we don't have the freedom to know what's on our label. Because corporations know, they put a little warning sign, GMO might be in these ingredients, people wouldn't buy. So I hope he wins. Watch the dairy, folks. Um, dairy is the number one. Wheat and dairy are about 85% of food sensitivities and allergies. Okay? Our, our dairy is not safe today. I think raw milk's fine. Organic milk probably has 55% more omegas than the regular milk, but the milk's pretty polluted. Plus, it's just, you know, in the wheat, too. You know, we're not, having, we're not drinking our grandmother's uh, foods here, especially the, the wheat. A lot of genetically modified stuff. We know about sugar. Walnuts and hazelnuts are especially just allergic, and he's kind of against eggs except a few times a week. Let's talk about rebuilding the forces. So we mentioned the redox, and this is how we can probably change things as we grow up. There's a whole concept of what's in our body, sodium, 
water, minerals, and a lot of emotions. That might be the four major things. So maybe we can change a couple of these things to improve what we call this communication of cells, redox. But the real aspect that he talks about is keeping this bacteria. So many things are eradicating it today. You know, 98% of our good bacteria we need. But the bad guys like strep and staph and E. coli and C. diff, oh, they could be eradicated by antibiotics. But antibiotics kill all the good guys, not just the bad guys. We all know that. So this antibiotic abuse is a big problem in the hospitals. Oh, you hear about it sometimes. It's a huge problem. So regeneration comes into play. And yes, probiotics come into play, and enzymes come into play, and raw foods come into play. But there's an aspect of keeping the lawn fertilized, right? I got this nice green lawn, and I want to keep it green. If I don't water and fertilize, I'm going to get weeds. And weeds in the gut could be gastritis and diverticulosis and Crohn's, but weeds can also be heart disease, cancer, and migraines. So we want to keep the weeds out. It's all about keeping the gut healthy. Alkalizing is one of the best ways to do this. I'm not going to get into the whole acid-base thing. We know alkalization is one of the primary fundamentals of good health because everything in our body, except our stomach acid, God gave us to break down food, is either neutral or slightly alkaline. There's a great trivia question about what's the only food in the world that's completely perfect alkaline, 7.34 pH. People say, well, I don't know, is it bananas or is it avocados? Actually, I think it came from above. It's mother's breast milk. Isn't that wonderful? Perfect pH for humans. So all these things could be helpful in, but one of the, the simplest things, it costs you a couple bucks a month, sodium bicarbonate, organic baking soda. Uh, don't use arm and hammer. I think there's aluminum in it, but a little bit of that can really settle some. We all remember, people my age remember all those Alka-Seltzer commercials. That's it. Okay, so pleomorphism is how we'll finish up. This is a concept that's very interesting because it's coming into play again, especially in Europe. Everybody remembers the father of medicine, Louis Pasteur, right? So he's called it back in the 1800s. Well, his contemporary was this guy called Bechamps in Paris. Now, Louis said, a bacteria is a bacteria, bacteria, kill it. Deschamps said, no, a bacteria will morph. It'll shape shift into things like viruses, funguses, molds. Well, on his deathbed, Pasteur said, Deschamps was right, I was wrong. But that's not the way medicine picked it up. So the new medicine that came 100 years later was, kill that bacteria, that's why antibiotics are around. Antibiotics are saving a lot of lives, but that's not the point anymore. But Shamps sees this whole aspect of pleomorph, morphing. And this has to do, again, with things like the Melu. So Sanum has done a great job in bringing this to, to light in the modern world, even though these are 70 or 80 years old. The pathogenicity of germs, uh, how they morph. So if you're just treating the bacteria, you may miss the whole thing. So many people have candida. Oh, yes, you can get on a candida diet. And you got it because you took an antibiotic and you have yeast. OK, that's short term. And you can take probiotics and take some antifungals, fine. But if you have pervasive candida, it can't be that. It's, it's changing. And a lot of times, it's attaching itself to things like heavy metals, mercury. And if you don't get rid of the mercury, you're not going to get rid of the mold, uh, the candida. I want to go into the cancer much, very much, because he has a protocol for it. So just real quickly, some of the machines that I've used in uh, the OligaScan machine, brought to me by the Nutritional Frontier people. Pretty accurate in measuring minerals, heavy metals, and toxins. I like it because it shows correlations, like 0 to 100%, like what's your enzyme status, what's your cardiovascular status. And of course, if it's low, we have to look into those things. Everybody has heavy metals. There's nobody who doesn't. We live in a pervasive world. And what's the answer to this? Well, we don't have another answer except detoxification. Now, there's methods to that, of course. But what we find today, since everybody has them, the most, most important thing is, are we a retainer or are we an excreter? Are we getting them out? That's important. And the best way to excrete, water and sweat, <laughs> number one. But we can look into things like chlorella and, and blue-green algae and many other things. But uh, retaining them can cause obsolete autoimmune issues. And then the other scan that I've been using from uh, Germany for a number of years can look at the energetic fields of our organs. Just like our voices have a different frequency, so does our heart, our liver, our colon, our brain, and all those other things. So we can measure those things, and we can look for imbalances. We're not curing. I never use the word cure. I'm looking to balance organs. I was in Greece a few weeks ago giving a talk to some alternative medicines, and I picked up a new machine from China called a resonance analyzer. 
Very interesting, too, because it'll look up uh, over like 36 different organ systems and give you some issues with inconsistencies. Thanks for your attention, and uh, have a good conference. Look at this book. <laughs>